All right, everybody, now that we've got our protocol sorted out, um, I'm happy to get started. Uh, so welcome uh, to this session on the BBC Microbit. My name is Thomas Ball. I'm a research manager and principal researcher at Microsoft Research Redmond. And I'm uh, wel welcome, welcome you to Faculty Summit, welcoming you to Faculty Summit. Uh, I am joined by uh, Joe Finney from Lancaster University and Ben Shapiro from the University of Colorado Boulder, who are both professors uh, who have been involved in CS education uh, at various levels in the software stack and are going to uh, tell us about their experience with the microbit as well. Uh, so the structure of this hour and now 20 minutes is that I'll kick off and give an overview of the microbit. Uh, then Joe will tell you more about the little operating system under the microbit, and then uh, Ben will tell you more about the microbit and CS education. And we're gonna hold questions till the end when all three of us will be available for about 10 to 15 minutes. Sounds perfect. Okay, great, yeah. thanks okay. gentlemen. Okay. Great, so I cut my teeth uh, in the late 70s and early 80s. Uh, on an Apple II. I was original Apple II, Apple fanboy. And uh, many of us who are in the 50-ish range, maybe 35 to 50, I don't know, no. pre-baby boomer, but somewhere like, like baby boomer wannabes, I don't know, we, 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 we got our start on 8-bit computers like this. And the big one in the lower left is something called the BBC Micro. And that's the, the predecessor the intellectual predecessor of the uh, BBC Microbit. So the BBC Micro was a computer that was designed uh, by Acorn Computing in conjunction with the BBC. And uh, the BBC actually did programming back, all the way back in the 80s they even did programming. And they had this bloke whose name I don't remember. Yeah, okay, and, uh, and he actually told you what a computer was. And this was back when you know, nobody knew what a personal computer was good for. And the BBC had really uh, the foresight uh, to uh, develop a computer, uh, to actually explain to the population what a computer was about, how it could change the world, and have programming uh, uh, to, support, uh, to support that. Uh, and, and so that was actually uh, something that was done now uh, you know, a good, uh, a good uh, some 30, year, 30 years ago. Uh, the BBC Microbit, what is that? So the BBC Microbit is a, is a new initiative, say a 21st century version of the BBC Micro. It's a, it's a very tiny uh, little computer, which is based on a microcontroller. Uh, and I have a whole bag of these things, uh, which I'm happy to give out to any audience member who would like one. Uh, afterwards, you can come up and get yours, and um, we have a little battery holder for it, and I'd, all that I'd like is your email address. So um, these things have been uh, created, designed by the BBC, with the idea of inspiring a new generation of uh, computer enthusiasts and computer scientists. Uh, but now with a device that's more of a, think of a IoT starter kit that has Bluetooth, that has a bunch of sensors that you can connect to the internet and do amazing things with it. So this is actually uh, the BBC uh, microbit here. This tiny little thing is about half the size of a, uh, uh, of a credit card. And uh, at the front of it, it's got a five by five, low, very low resolution display, five by five LEDs, but it's good enough to do little games. It's got an A and B button and it's got at the lower edge this interconnect so you can uh, connect it to other sensors and other devices via I2C or various serial protocols. So it's a friendly little piece of hardware which has some nice graphic design. Um, it's, got, it's supported by a very simple software stack. So when you get something like an ARM-based computer, generally you go right into C++, you go into low-level hacking, but BBC wanted to make this and has made a million of these available to every fifth grader. So how the heck did we take an ARM-based microcontroller device and make it uh, 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 programmable by fifth graders? We, we used a lot of the technology uh, of compilers and programming languages. And, and third, uh, we developed a bunch of learning and training material uh, to support the teachers in the UK. So the, the whole idea of the, the BBC Microbit uh, is uh, uh, first and foremost to support 
uh, the UK, the first country in the world to mandate CS education for K through 12. And they gave away, and we just finished this, they gave away a million of these to every fifth grader, uh, that's year seven in the UK parlance, every fifth grader, so 11 or 12 year old, and every one of their teachers. And so uh, the, the seeding has, has happened in the, in the last school year, and that's building upon a lot of work that's gone before uh, to get actually the curriculum established, uh, CS education curriculum established in the UK. And Simon Peyton Jones, who some of you may know uh, from the UK MSR lab, was instrumental in, in getting that going. So if you flip this micro bit around, uh, you'll see actually uh, the parts of the micro bit are labeled. Uh, there are two microcontroller processors on there. One is to uh, make the device appear as a USB uh, drive uh, on a PC, Mac, or Linux box. The other is a, is a larger chip on the upper left is a Nordic chip that has a ARM Cortex M0 with a full 16K of memory. So RAM, we're talking, your program resides in 128K of flash. Uh, there's an accelerometer and a compass, so it can, you can embed it and, in devices and read, uh, make physics experiments. Um, there's actually in the upper left, you can't see it very well because it's so dark, but that black area there is the antenna for Bluetooth. So it can also uh, communicate with other devices. Um, and it's got quite a bit packed into a small surface area. Joe is gonna tell you more about the hardware, so I'm not going to go more into that. I'm, I'm on the software side. My team did the software stack, uh, and we enabled, uh, we enabled a whole bunch of people to come in with co different code editors, and that's what I want to show you now. So quick demo, we will go to uh, the web browser. And if we, uh, if we back up, uh, you can go to this too, and uh, it's microbit.co.uk. And uh, the BBC uh, has created with a number of partners a whole bunch of materials, learning materials, activities, tutorials around the microbit. They've got various celebrities uh, involved in spreading the word about uh, about um, how computer science is is uh, is a uh, is a, is a cool profession, uh, there's amazing things you can do with it. Um, and then there's a whole set of partners. Uh, if you go down to the, the, uh, the bottom here, uh, this is a huge effort of uh, a number of partners, uh, some technical like Microsoft, ARM, others uh, like Barclays, providing funding, providing programming, uh, the Bluetooth, CannyBot, Cisco, uh, Coder Dojo, um, folks who are doing uh, camps, coding camps, uh, Lancaster University providing the, uh, the microbit runtime, uh, the National STEM Center with activities, uh, hardware, hardware uh, uh, component manufacturers like Nordix and NXP, uh, the Python Foundation, uh, Samsung bringing in a smartphone app. So this has been a huge effort organized by the BBC but implemented by a huge set of partners. Um, and I'll have a little bit more to say about that. But let's, let's go in and create code and, and show you um, how, we, uh, how we program the microbit. So my microbit is hooked up uh, to my surface here via USB. Um, and I can choose one of various programming languages and editors. Um, we're gonna choose the block editor, which is based on Google Blockly. So this is very familiar to those with, who've had experience with Scratch. Um, so you get a canvas on the left-hand side. Um, you get uh, a, a set of blocks you can use. You can drag a block onto the canvas. On the right-hand side, you have a simulator, uh, so you can run your program even if you don't have the micro bit handy. Uh, and then here, you can just directly uh, create an image for display on the five by five LED. So very quickly, without really directly programming, you know, you hit the run button. Um, and if everything works out, you get a smiley face, right? So, so fundamentally, you, you have a very graphical, uh, easy way to get started. Uh, for those of you who haven't seen a Scratch, there's no way to create syntax errors. So you get a forever loop, you, you plop show LEDs in there. You know, maybe what we'd like to do is, uh, is make the smiley face blink. So what we're gonna do is go in there and get uh, the pause, and maybe we'll duplicate that with a keyboard shortcut. Um, okay, and now we run that, and now we're in an infinite loop uh, forever, just blinking 
the smiley face, pausing a little bit, clearing the screen, pausing again. So very, very simple to get started, uh, but as you see, there are other drawers in the, uh, in the programming. There's a whole set of event handlers. There's things like temperature, compass, can, is a button pressed. Uh, you can get access to the light level, and Joe may say something about how we use the LED array to sense light, not just emit light. Um, there's uh, there's uh, direct access to the LED matrix to plot. Uh, there are obviously loops and logic, the core parts of the programming language, um, and there's other support for programming against the pins. So that was the simulator. Uh, how do we get the code onto the micro bit? You can see here, maybe you can't see, it's not smiling. Um, so what we do is we press the compile button and we have a compile chain that works entirely inside the browser. So we have a compiler all the way to ARM machine code written essentially in JavaScript and we link that against a pre-compiled binary and now uh, what's happening is we get a smiley face. Everybody see that? Blinky smiley face. Uh, if, you, if you can't see it very well, okay, put it here. There we go. Okay, so what actually happened there was, was a shortcut that I put in. Um, if we look at the downloads folder here, we will see that uh, we saved a file. Uh, we, we, we saved this file to the micro bit, uh, to the download folder. And down here, you see that there is a, uh, a micro bit drive. And so the, the firmware on this, on this board uh, exposes the, uh, via USB, exposes the micro bit as a drive, and once you have the binary, you simply copy it over. So that's how easy that is uh, to do. And I see we're going to run into trouble with a maintenance micro bit here, potentially. Yeah, so that's always fun, too. Uh, I'm gonna unplug that and find a different micro bit to use. Um, that's for a demo later. Okay, so that's, that's essentially uh, the programming experience, very simple. But what I didn't show you was there are other editors, other programming languages, uh, and I don't like the display setting it's giving me, so let me duplicate that. So another, th another thing we did, uh, which I should have demoed and will demo now, is to convert uh, the block-based program into a, into a syntax uh, direct, uh, a, m a more uh, uh, typical textual program. So here we're converting it automatically into the touch develop language, but essentially you get uh, the same simulator experience, um, but now you have essentially a token-based editor where you, can, where you can make syntax errors. You can have a, uh, a namespace here without, uh, um, you can have a parentheses there, without uh, left parentheses, without a closing parentheses. So uh, one of the ideas was to have a programming progression from the block-oriented programming uh, to a more traditional text. And there's also a JavaScript and a, and a Python, uh, a Python uh, editor as well. So the, one of the key ideas of the micro bit, first is make it very simple to program the micro bit, simulate it in the web browser, test and experiment put the code onto the micro bit, but also really have a, 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 set of, a rich set of sensors and a rich set of features so that you can take that micro bit and not just make a blinky face, but embed it inside a project. Maybe you, wanna, maybe you wanna put it inside a football and throw the football and then capture some data and do some data science using the accelerometer, right? And, and so the micro bit is, is a low power controller uh, that works off of uh, AAA batteries. So you have access through the IO pins. As we'll see later, we, ha we, we use a lower level in the Bluetooth stack to uh, actually transmit data wirelessly over the micro bit as well. Um, so fundamentally, we have all the programming language features, uh, for loops, procedures, small, uh, some lists, arrays, data structures, but we also have a rich set of sensors um, and we have the ability to do actuation via uh, wiring to motors as well. So there are examples with uh, robots and things like that. Uh, everything is web-based. Uh, what you've seen is, is completely encapsulated inside a web app, so that includes the editor, the debugger, the simulator, as well as the compiler. So this actually will work on a Chromebook. You can stick your micro bit into a Chromebook. It's got Linux underneath and, and the, uh, the device is recognized. And again, you save, you save a file to the directory, you copy it over to USB. It works across Windows, it works on Android smartphones, it works on Mac OS. So part of the idea in education is that we're really in a heterogeneous environment. We needed to make the BBC micro bit work 
anywhere, and we also wanted to make it as friction free as possible in a lot of uh, school systems. Installing a, a new compiler or a new IDE onto the school system is that's a heavyweight operation for administrators. So by making thing, everything in a web app, uh, we tried to remove the friction as much as possible. Although you will be, believe it or not, there are some school systems that lock down USB, so anything you plug into USB has to be an encrypted drive. And microbit is not an encrypted drive, right? So, so that goes so far, but we tried to really make it simple to code anywhere. We also created a whole set of lessons. Uh, these focus more on the maker lessons, but uh, we needed to give the teacher something to start with. You know, it's a non-starter to just say, here's a computer and it's great to program and you know, your kids will have fun. No, we needed a whole set of materials. So we and others put together uh, content ranging from uh, basic computer science uh, to things that are more uh, maker-based, uh, maker-inspired, um, uh, teaching various concepts like communication with the telegraph, uh, hacking your headphone, learning about musical tones and frequency generation. You know, each of these is a little lesson. And in the UK, the notion of a curriculum is very broad. Uh, there's no, uh, the curriculum is, as, as they like to, Simon likes to say, two sheets of A4, right? So it's a very high level set of guidelines uh, and how you implement it, it's up to the teachers. So one of the things we did was also to create a whole set of lessons across a, a variety of different topics. Okay, the core technology partnership that made this, this possible when you saw the, uh, the whole thing run there. Uh, at uh, Microsoft, Lancaster, ARM, and Element 14, we all collaborated around the design of the board, uh, around the hardware design, as well as thinking about the software stack. So at the bottom, it's an ARM chip with the, based on the embed standard. Above there is some C++ code uh, that Joe will talk about. And then at the top, we have the website, we have the compiler, a set of services, uh, the, run, the runtime simulation and compiling. So from an education perspective, there's actually a, quite a deep stack. So although the micro bit is simple, simple to use, if you peel the onion, you can learn a lot about programming languages. There's a little operating system. At the low level, uh, there's this cool hardware and the ARM embed platform that's all open as well, so uh, that's a whole ecosystem. So uh, a lot of that's hidden away, but I think one of the things that we're interested in, especially for university uh, folk, is to think about, well, how would you take the micro bit and incorporate it into a course? Maybe you're teaching something about operating systems, you wanna start with something that is a very small operating system, or maybe you, you're using, uh, you're working with Arduino and embedded, you'd like to try something out. So that's the whole uh, sort of core technology stack. Uh, what's not said there is we also have uh, uh, some Bluetooth uh, technology in there as well, and Joe will talk about that. So this is essentially what happened when you saw uh, me uh, uh, compiling from the blocks. Uh, we, we started in the block editor script. Uh, we compile entirely within the browser into touch develop, which is sort of our core language for the micro bit uh, for the BBC. Uh, and that's our intermediate representation, if you will. And then we wrote a compiler from touch develop, from a subset of touch develop uh, to ARM assembler, and we wrote an ARM assembler basically in JavaScript to ARM machine code as well as a linker. And so uh, that linker uh, takes a pre-compiled ARM runtime, which is Joe's C++ runtime and links it. So fundamentally, you know, you get the web app, you've got the whole uh, debug simulate cycle along with the compiler, you get a binary at the end, you save it to the disk, and then the micro bit exposes it uh, uh, the, the file system interface and you copy it over. So, so very simple in terms of deployment, uh, in terms of making it easy to use. So people have been asking us, how has it been, go how has it been going with the micro bit? This is just to say, uh, yeah, go on Twitter. I think this is the best way. These pictures were captured from, if you go to Twitter and just search for micro bit, you'll see lots of uh, things going on, pictures of kids in the classroom, uh, uh, there's various activities after school, in school. Our CEO actually went to one of the schools and got a demo of what the kids were making um, at, at an Eastern London school. There have been various articles uh, about, uh, about the goals of the project. And even um, there was a micro bit sent into, uh, well, yes, I don't know how high it went. It was, uh, it didn't go into orbit, but it almost looks like it. So um, we'll say a little bit more about satellites in, in a second. Uh, 
In addition, a number of the partners like Kitronics have been creating uh, kits around the microbit. So the microbit has that little uh, interface, that edge connector, um, and there's a car where you plug the microbit into the car, and now you use the microbit to control the car. The car has extra sensors. Um, there's, uh, there's somebody who created a lightsaber with the microbit, various magazines working on that. One of the very exciting projects has been uh, something called the mock model rocket car. And this is a project uh, based on uh, setting a world land speed record with a real rocket car uh, done in the UK. And to inspire kids, they created a kit um, with a model rocket in the back. And the idea is to create your car and then, and then fire it off on this track and see how fast it will go. And then um, bring in aspects of mechanical engineering, uh, uh, physics to make the fastest car. And so this competition, uh, we got involved in that and added the micro bit to the mix so that we can add data science. And I think the best way to see this, uh, besides uh, seeing the cars going, uh, is, to, is, is to play a little uh, video for you uh, of that because it's, it really shows how the micro bit was used in a, in a very nice way uh, in, in a larger project. Let me bring that up. Oh, I've got it here already. We're here today at Kennett School in Newbury to launch the England and Wales Race for the Line competition to engage with 11 to 16 year old children to enter and build the fastest foam rocket car that they can. The whole idea of these projects is to get kids excited by science. Now, there is nothing more exciting than building a car yourself, putting a rocket in it and firing it across your playground. My kids have done their eyes like dinner plates when they do this. To take something that you think is just a blue block of foam and then to have that transformed into a, into a racing car against your friends and seeing flames coming out the back as it whooshes down the track. And not only that, through the micro bit, you can then see all those changes you make, the effect that has on the real car. When they finish the run, they can take that data, upload it onto a, a system and compare with their, their peers and their friends then onto the national leaderboard. Bringing external partners into an education environment allow the pupils to actually talk to people in the real world so they can actually talk to these people and understand that connection between what they are doing and the outside world. What we have to do is we have to program this, it monitors the speed and then we have to try to make it as fast as it can to beat the other competitors and win. We'll be learning physics based subjects so we'll be learning about air resistance and speed and, and also propulsion with the rocket that we're using but we'll also be using um, computing to analyse graphs and put information into a table on that level. We've never really done something like this before in like primary school so it's like interesting to see all the different things we're using to like make the car. I like coding and stuff like that as a hobby. It lets me to basically show what I think of so I can make a game about what I've dreamed about. We are about increasing life chances. We are about allowing our pupils to reach their potential and to be able to say we can engage them in a GCSE subject because they understand the purpose of it and they can see the end game. It's, it's a wonderful opportunity. Okay, so that's, I'm going to cut off Andrew there. He's talking about how great Microsoft is. Um, but that's, you're getting a lot of that from Faculty Summit. Um, so, so that gives you a little idea of, of how the micro bit was embedded inside this larger project to enable the data collection of how the car was working. And then, and then for the students to iterate using the data to figure out how, could, how they could improve the car. So let me talk very quickly about what's next. Um, the first thing that's happening, people ask us, well, where can I get a micro bit? And since you're here, you can get one from me at the end. But if people want to buy them, we are working with Farnell and other partners to make them commercially available uh, in the UK and the EU first. Uh, and then we are working on plans to bring it to the States, to bring it to other countries. But right now, um, you have to ship to the UK. So if you have a friend in the UK, uh, you, can, you can order it and, and have it shipped. And I guess they can figure out what to do with it from there. Um, the other thing we're doing is we've created a new website uh, called codethemicrobit.com that is uh, based on our experience using touch develop for the microbit. And I'd like to give you a quick demo of that uh, and, and also uh, tell you a little bit about where we're taking, uh, where we're taking the microbit. 
Um, so one of the things you noticed with uh, the microbit simulator before was there was a single one. Um, the, here you see something interesting. There are two microbits happening uh, uh, um, on the left-hand side. And what's going on? What's going on here is we are using uh, a forever loop to forever send out to any microbit that's listening our, the value of our accelerometer. And then simultaneously, every microbit is just waiting to hear uh, if there's anything in the ether and grabbing any number and just plotting it on, on the, uh, uh, plotting a bar graph. And so what every microbit is doing is it's saying, here's my accelerometer reading, and then all the microbits are also looking for other accelerometer readings and, and plotting them. So when we play this in codethemicrobit.com, we see that if we move the accelerometer in the x direction in the lower microbit, we change the value in the upper microbit and also symmetrically. Now, if you have more than two, yeah, what's gonna happen? That's, that's a good, uh, and, and the generalization is always an interesting problem. But let me, show you, uh, let me show you a quick little demo there of how this is going to work. So we've got two microbits, right? And we'd like them to communicate with each other. So we're gonna compile it. Uh, again, it's a browser-based compiler. Um, the microbits are flashing. I don't know if you can see the dots. It means that the, the code is going on to both microbits. Okay. And now I can hold one microbit steady and then use this microbit in the x direction to change the value. And I hope everybody can sort of see that. So we've got now two microbits uh, communicating uh, across Bluetooth. Um, and very simply, we can create little ad hoc networks of the microbits. The other thing you might notice is that at the bottom here, uh, there's a little data stream. And so the other thing that's happening is that the microbits are streaming their data through serial back into the browser, and I get a little function. Well, what if you wanted to do some data science where everybody's sensor was streamed into the cloud? Uh, and then you could share the data. So we've also made that possible now. You can start streaming your data uh, into Azure. We give every student or every microbit a little table. It's not very big, maybe a couple megabytes, right? Um, a very small amount. And then what we can do is uh, we see it's streaming to the cloud. We can go, uh, we can get a URL, and we get a little, uh, we get a little URL here that we can, that we can uh, get access to that data, and we can get access to it, say, from Excel. Um, but it's basically a standard data format, so really you could, you could have uh, different, data, different data sources here. Uh, so if I go to data here and I say, I have a new query uh, from other sources from the web, what I can do here is um, plug in that URL, Okay, and now what's happening is I've got the data streaming from my micro microbit to this gateway, to the, the PC here, and that data then is going up into Azure where anybody can basically uh, now see the data. Okay, and at this point, yes, I have to say load it. Okay, and there's the data. And, and so I can do something, for example, like uh, insert maybe scatter plot, and I can see some of that data. And I think we update like every, I don't know, every 18 seconds or 20 seconds or something. So you can refresh this, you can get a live stream. It's a, it's a buffer, so it wraps around eventually. But that just gives you an idea, with a few clicks, we're able to start doing some, some very basic uh, data analysis. So, so what you saw there, although there was one step missing, uh, was data you know, going into the, into the web browser, saved up to Azure, and then anybody else can connect to that data stream. So you could imagine a whole set of students doing their experiment, loading that data to Azure, uh, having it come back. So the thing that we're doing now is to take the microbit and go sort of much wider than we did with the BBC microbit. BBC microbit was done over a year and a half <laughs> from the initial prototype when it was complete to the full design and, and the million cents. So we did a lot in a year and a half together, uh, but now we have a new framework 
And we really think of the microbit as a new generation of device that brings together the integration of sensors with the microcontroller, uh, with a display. So that's really easy and simple to get started with. Uh, we want that simple experience that combines a programming progression, networking of devices, uh, as well as making it easy to get data off the devices and bring it uh, and bring it in for analysis. So like a simple IoT or a starter, starter device. And all this is open, open source as well. So uh, I really think that the microbit is at the center of a sort of an interesting trend bringing together CS education, uh, physical computing, the idea of these devices, embedded devices that you can create projects around. So when you create a system, the computer is just a part of a larger system that you, the student or the teacher or the inventor creates. Um, and then really this idea of Internet of Things really is that those devices have the ability to send data into the cloud as well as to change their behavior based on analysis that's, that's done in the cloud. Um, so we're looking with our new project and what's going on uh, with this Programming Experience Toolkit uh, and your cooperation uh, to, move this, to move this forward. Uh, I don't have time to talk about satellite science. We're also working on embedding the, the microbit as part of a, a nano satellite. Um, but just, to, uh, but just to, to sum up my part, um, we really think that the, the BBC did a great service uh, in designing the microbit and, and bringing it into the UK. We think it's a, an interesting combination of hardware, software, and that really has legs in the sense of uh, an integrated set of devices and sensors that can be used not just in computer science, but in STEM. And we're really looking uh, to you to help us uh, think about how would we incorporate something like the microbit uh, into other areas, into courses, uh, into your research, uh, or if you have new ideas in hardware, how would we bring that? Uh, so again, uh, I, I'd uh, welcome you to get a microbit at the end of the session uh, and follow up with me uh, via email. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Joe. He'll tell you more about the little operating system. Awesome. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Wasn't that great? That was cool. I love those things. Those Bloodhound projects were awesome. They were really awesome. To actually see the kids actually going end to end, designing hardware, measuring it like a scientist, improving, refining, and taking it out into the field is just magnificent. Really, really good. OK, so thank you for that, very much for that, Tom. So my name's uh, Joe, Joe Finney. I'm from uh, Lancaster University in the UK. That's in the northwest of uh, England and also in the northwest of Europe, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, we are still on the same continent, which is good. Now, what I'm going to do today is to talk to you a little bit more about what we call the microbit runtime. So this is the magical uh, layer that uh, Tom was talking about there that that in-browser compiler links with to make the magic binary that hits the microbit to make it happen, to make your program actually run. But the first thing I'm going to do is tell you just a little bit more about the hardware, because it's really, really quite important and relevant. So if you look at a microbit, the first thing you notice when you look at the front of it, it's a very friendly, accessible device. It looks very small, looks almost like it's got a face, little eyes. Look, it's even got her on top. Actually, one of the biggest design projects actually from our design team was the different hair styles they actually went through that got printed on the front of this thing. Um, but what you quickly start to look at as, a, as a, obviously a scientist is to look at the capabilities of that device. So the first thing is the high resolution screen, 25 pixels, ladies and gents. Okay. The reason for that, yeah, the kids of that age can count to 25. They can count, count to 25 megapixels, right? So actually refining the problem down to the simple canonical case of what really matters is very important. So on there's a very simple 25 single color LED display. And as Tom mentioned also, a light sensor. You might notice I've actually highlighted the same block. And that's for you. any physicists amongst you may know that actually if you have an LED, you will do two things for you, depending which way around you connect it. If you put it one way around, it shines light. If you put it a different way around, it's actually a light sensor. So it can actually tell you a light level. So this is a very good example of what Microbit was all about from the start. Taking something very basic, something very simple, yeah, and making the most of what you've got. Okay, and conveying those simple principles to kids. So we do that too. We have two buttons, very simple. Uh, the kids can code against, so they can do whatever they want. And a whole set of digital I.O. on the bottom. So 17 digital input output pins that you can flip to high and low voltages so the kids can use that to connect to any other uh, external devices. A set of analog inputs, which are good for additional sensors. 
PWM outputs, which are great for controlling things like servos, motors, or any other uh, uh, kind of power equipment. Some of the pins are actually touch sensitive as well, so kids can actually plug them into other devices and get them to react when they touch to it, okay? uh, which anybody in the field will probably be familiar with Makey Makey, which is quite good where kids tend to plug it into like fruits and like jellies and stuff like that, and it creates a very creative environment where kids can actually create devices, not just little components. And also for the geeks amongst us, of which I'm definitely one, um, I2C, SPI, and UART, which are serial protocols, which make it very easy to connect to other hardware devices that have uh, computers within them. But that's just on the friendly side. If you flip it over to the back, actually what you find is a remarkably powerful IoT device yeah, that's actually presented in a nice friendly face with hair. So right on there, there's a 32-bit Cortex-M0 core. Yeah, this is a non-negligible processor. So it only runs at 16 megahertz, but that's a super scalar processor. You can still do a lot of processing in 16 megahertz. It has 16K of RAM and 256K of program memory. This is going to come back to haunt us, because right now you're probably thinking what I thought when I started the project. How are we going to fit onto that? Well, that sounds painful, and it was. But I'll tell you about some of the tricks that we got to make that happen. We have the USB interface, which allows us to uh, get that nice drag and drop programming experience that Tom was talking about, but also a, a serial line and hardware debugger. In the bottom left corner is a three axis accelerometer like there is in your iPads or surfaces, if you haven't got a surface, that works too, uh, or in your phone, which allows not just you know, the measurement of acceleration in the case of rocket cars, all that's super cool, but also things like gestures. So these are the devices in your phone that let it know when you turn it, when you tilt it. So this actually provides a gesture input to your device. A three-axis magnetometer, which gives you a digital compass and also a magnetic sensor. Uh, a temperature sensor, again, another brilliant case of reuse. Notice I'm highlighting the processor there. That's because we actually use the die temperature on the processor to determine the ambient temperature of the room. That's how efficient the processors are on the next generation of Cortex-M0s. You actually can clock this thing at 60 megahertz full on, and it deviates by about half a degree. It's amazing. Okay, very efficient chips. And also built into the same chip, uh, a Bluetooth RF interface that we've heard. So actually, I'm sure you'll agree when you look at that. That kind of hardware, that would take the Pepsi challenge against most IoT sensors in the field today. And we're just giving it to kids. But that's the idea. Give them growth space. Now, come to the part that uh, Lancaster has been doing. Um, so this came about because the BBC actually approached Lancaster. We had to do a lot of work with them in the past. And they basically said to us, we're doing this cool educational project involving technology. And we said, fantastic. Okay. Would you like to play with us, said the BBC. And we said, yeah, sounds great. What is it? Can't tell you. OK. Is there any money? No. <laughs> is it going to involve a lot of work? Yes. I thought, I'm in. That sounds fantastic. You know, it's got to be good, right? So, so we did that. And uh, the challenge that we actually had was to take this device, the micro bit. We knew from day one we wanted it to be a very open, multi-language environment, supporting as things Tom has shown you already. So you know, the block editor, touch develop, PXT, JavaScript, C, C++, Python, all these high-level languages, which are, make it nice and easy for all of us to program, not just kids, but adults. And a set of hardware, which is incredibly resource constrained, very low level, yeah, typically written in C and C++. And our job was to provide the glue that joins that together within incredibly small RAM and flash memory constraints. So how can we provide the sort of abstractions that Tom and his team need for those high level languages on such resource constrained hardware? Well, that's what we've been working on for the last year or so in, uh, in what we call the microbit runtime, often also called the microbit DAL or device abstraction layer. And what this is is an open source C, C++ uh, component-based model, okay, which basically provides an abstraction over all that hardware, which is kind of useful. But not just that, we provide a lot of the high-level language features that you'd expect from things like Java, JavaScript, C Sharp, and Python. Right, that you take for granted in modern operating systems and squeeze it onto this very, very small chip. So we need to do all this with bearing one eye on RAM and power efficiency very much all the time. So if we just drill into a little bit more detail, this is what the microbit runtime looks like under the hood. At the bottom, we have um, close to the metal, the Nordic SDK, which is the big blob of C functions, which uh, allows you access to the hardware. ARM embed, which is a super useful abstraction layer, which gives you three key things. 
One is actually something we call a, a HAL, a hardware abstraction layer. And this means that uh, whichever chip you happen to be using, as long as it's got an ARM core on it, it can kind of make it look the same to high level programming languages. So if you want to flip a bit on your output pin, it looks the same on any of these chips. So that's really useful. The other thing it gives you is that lovely drag and drop programming interface over USB, which is super useful. And finally, it gives you a hardware debugger that you can actually have through the, through the uh, USB port as well. So we build on top of that. Uh, to, to have the microbit runtime, which here I've split into five different sections for you, which I'll be taking in turn. Okay, so this may be familiar to some of you. The first thing we have is something called managed types. So this actually provides a degree of simple memory management. So those high level languages don't need to worry about the nasties of like, allocating and freeing memory. An eventing system called a message bus. A scheduler, which runs on this device as well. A heap of device drivers to access all the things on there. And also the radio interfaces as well all in this little chip. So how do we go about that? Well, we'll start with managed types and what that is. So we all probably, at some level, love C and C++. And in the same breath, we hate it as well, right? Because it gives us, a computer scientist, a heap of power and control, which is really cool. On the other hand, it gives you a ton of responsibility that you don't really want. And the sort of things that you typically don't want are the problems caused by simple code like this, where you might come along, Say, I want a variable, some memory, so I'm going to use some very low level function like malloc on you to create some memory. And then nothing in your system really looks after that for you. It's your responsibility as a programmer to then decide who frees that memory, how long it stays there, have you got any memory leaks, all these kind of things that as computer scientists we left a long time ago to things like operating systems and runtime environments. All right. Well, down in this embedded world, this stuff still exists, you see, yeah, because you don't have an OS or a real runtime environment a lot of the time. Yeah, so we actually provide some of those basic abstractions. We use a very simple technique, okay? So nothing quite as advanced as you'll see in the JVMs or, or the .NET, or the CLR, so common language runtime, in case of .NET. But we use something simple called basic reference counting on the key data types that we have in the runtime. So we create specific types for things like strings, the images that Tom was doing with the little dinky smiley face, yeah, packets for the radio and we build into those data types implicit reference counting. So each of those things know within the runtime how much they've been used and tracked. So you'll never have memory leaks with these devices, right? With these specific types that we create. And we also provide some generic ones for uh, user-defined types as well. And this also has a very nice side effect so that uh, C++ being C++, if you munge it enough, gives you the ability to create actual interfaces and syntax which looks much like a higher level language. Right. So most of you have probably seen and touched C at some point, but this is C on top of the micro bit. If you look at kind of what I'm doing there, I'm using things like uh, copy a sign, so I can basically create strings and assign one to the other with an equal sign without the risk of memory getting lost or uh, overwritten. I can use a plus operator to, can can to concatenate many strings together, and I can type infer things like integers up to strings. Why is that super important? Well, compare that to what you just saw in blocks a moment ago. And that, what you find there is a building block for that compiler yeah, to actually then build the blocks that you, that you see there. Now, moving on to something else that's kind of cool, I like, something called a message bus. So again, you might think again, the micro bit, why would you want all these kind of complex operating system concepts? Well, let's take a look at some super simple code on button A, print a string. On button B, print another string. This is super common code. You'll see this in Scratch, you'll see it in Blocks, you see it on embedded devices too. Yeah. How would you actually build that without an eventing model? How would you, know, you actually take those high-level blocks and convert them down into low-level C code without some idea of first-class events? It's a very difficult thing to do. So what we actually create in the microbit runtime it's a very simple managed type called microbit event, which is you know, super intricate in that it has two numbers, two whole integers, yeah, 16 bit. And that constitutes an event. So one of those numbers is we know as an ID or a source ID. So this actually tells you which component on your device, like the display or the accelerometer or the network, generated the event. The second number is user-defined within that component. So it basically tells you from that component what it is. Perfect enumeration. So for example, I might have, uh, this is actually taken from the real code, number 27 
is a component that handles gestures on the micro bit. So it can tell if your micro bit's held up, turned left, it's been shaked, it's in free fall, you know, all those kind of events. So that has an ID of 27. We have another number, shake, which has number 11, which is only unique to this component. Okay, there'd be a value of 11 for lots of other things. Maybe it means the data's ready as well, but that would come from a different component. And put together, it will give you something unique within that micro bit identifying that event. To raise an event, you simply create an instance of that object. So you say, create me a micro bit event with these codes, and you're done. That will create and raise an event. So what you then want to do is be able to deliver that event somewhere else. So for that, we actually use a callback mechanism, an asynchronous callback mechanism. So I have a simple function that basically says, in my code, I'd like to listen for events from a certain component with a certain ID, in this case, shake. And when that happens, call my on shake function. So it's a simple callback, you might think. We also have some wildcard values. So you could say things like, I'd like to listen for any event from the gesture recognizer and then call on gesture. And then inside there, you may choose to you know, introspect the value of the event that you've got and decide what to do. Or if you're really keen, you could say, I'd like all the events generated ever from my whole micro bit. And then just, I wouldn't recommend that. It generates a whole heap of events. And just to give you some kind of ideas of the, the kind of events that we generate as standard on there. So there are events for all those gestures. So tilt up, tilt down, left, right, face up, forward, face down, device in free fall, uh, device has been shaken. Uh, we even went all out on the, uh, on the buttons, although there's only two buttons. It's one of the most complex bit of HCI development I ever did. Okay, you've now got button up, button down, hold, click, double click, all these kind of stuff for kids to play with, crazy stuff. Now, on here, we also built, as I say, a scheduler. Now, as for why, I'm going to go back to my really, really simple example. On button, scroll a string on the display. If I press button A, I want to scroll hello. Press button B, I want to say goodbye. Oh, really simple. What behavior would you actually expect from that? Just pause on that for a minute. How long do you think it would take to scroll a string on the display? A couple of seconds, actually. So what would you like to happen while that's going on? Do you want to not bother listening for other events? That would be a pretty you know, uninteractive experience. Right? What if there are other things that are going on, like detecting a shake event, for example, and doing something in the background, streaming data to your cloud, listening for data on your radio? Suddenly you realize these incredibly simple devices have very sophisticated design patterns that you actually want to put on the software. So for that, we actually build a, a scheduler, which uh, actually allows multi-threading on top of the micro bit. So we have this concept of something called a fiber scheduler, which is a very lightweight scheduler. Now, fibers we can create at any point in time, run independently of each other like a thread, but by design, by design, not because it was cheap, are non-preemptive. Right? So unlike your modern operating systems, if you create one thread, it will never be preempted by another unless it gives away control. The big reason for that, actually, is that kids can understand it. If you do a preemptive scheduler, you're going to get race conditions everywhere, right? And they get very complex code, right? With a non-preemptive scheduler, the people coding can decide, you know, when they want to block on something, like scroll, for example, which takes a long period of time, or wait for something. So what we have are some key operations like, you know, print, sleep, scroll on the display, et cetera, wait for a packet, which basically are blocking and will block your fiber. And others, yeah, can then get in and start to execute in the background. Okay? But again, they won't be preemptive. Um, I'll skip that because we don't have much time now then. But here's a little bit of magic that actually makes all this glue happen. When you register an event handler on the message bus, or when you register for something to happen, transparently behind the scene, that will be called in its own fiber. So when you call an event handler, like on message A, on button B, when that happens, you get your own dedicated bit of code, right? Which again seems simple, but if you want to know, you know, surely this is new and it's going to confuse kids, right? Go home and try this in Scratch on two buttons. You'll find actually that's threaded. So this is actually a very familiar model for kids that have been pro uh, programming in this asynchronous way. So it now means because we create a fiber as soon as we actually uh, 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 raise an event for your handler, it basically means code like this, which again means very simple canonical case that actually provides us with a headache, turns purely into this code I've shown you above, which I'm sure you probably agree is actually super simple and pretty elegant, okay? 
So not only does it make it easy to generate and cross-compile code from things like PXT, but it does mean also that when you write it natively in C or C++, it's pretty clean. And just about with this point where we started coding, we started to realize something as we developed more and more and more depth, if you like, into this and refined it more. We started to realize, you know, when you design things for kids, it works great for grown-ups too. That simplicity and elegance that you get from focusing on these really simple cases. What we're actually building is a remarkably simple, yet scalable and extensible runtime environment for IoT. Okay, so the other thing you'll find in, uh, in the runtime is a whole set of device drivers. I won't go into a lot of detail. Um, if you'd like to know more about it, we're very open source. Okay, all our docs are online as well. There's some links at the end. Do, do go and visit us and see us. But you'll find what we've done is to take a very object-oriented approach to the problem, which suits uh, ARM embed, which happens to be a C++ layer. And you'll find when you look at it, very clean class model, so one object yeah, per physical component. So you get a software component for every hardware component on the device. So it makes a very kind of clear match to anyone trying to understand it. So you'll find, for example, an accelerometer class that deals with accelerometer, button that deals with the button, you know, a storage that deals with flash storage, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If you'd like to know more, to go and look at that. Um, one thing that uh, I will mention, though, is the way we actually deal with abstraction in the runtime as well. Because if you give someone classical C++ API, it's usually pretty ugly. Does anybody actually use one? Does anybody code it against something in C++? Commiserations to all of you. Commiserations, yeah. Because typically, you know, your average C++ developer can't resist using those really advanced features you know, that actually make it very hard to read. We did the opposite. We actually keep it super clean. All you'll find is some basic inheritance, yeah, basic encapsulation, and that's it. But the other thing you'll find in these high-level languages, you won't find any blocks that say, hey, make me a new button, click. Make me a new accelerometer, click. We don't want kids to see things at that level. Okay, it's too complex, too nitty-gritty. So we use a little bit of abstraction here, and we make a final class called microbit, which is basically a bag of all the components that make up your device. So in class microbit, you'll just find a whole heap of instances, like you know, two instances of a button, one instance of a display, you know, one instance of an accelerometer, all kind of pre-configured. So it makes it very easy for, for you know, users to actually go in and say, you know, make me an instance of microbit, microbit dot, access my display, call the scroll method, hello world, yeah. Which is, by the way, completely memory safe because we're using these managed types, okay. So that's kind of giving you a little snapshot of uh, what all that looks like. Here's a little snapshot of how well it worked. Because we're scientists, right? We like to measure stuff. Of course, it's cool. So here's a snapshot of uh, actually the memory footprint of the device. So over here we have uh, the flash memory. So this is 256K. So this is the non-volatile stuff where your program goes. And this is your RAM over here. So we have 16K of this stuff, which is where your variables and uh, all that kind of goodies go, of course. Um, what you'll notice is there's a whole heap gone for something called soft device. That's the Bluetooth stack. Not a lot we can do about that. Um, over in the RAM side, 2K for the ARM kind of environment. Notice the rest of our runtime actually fits in 1.5K of that 16K. So that includes the scheduler, all the device drivers, yeah, the, and the reference types and all the other goodies that you're talking about. In Flash, we also fit in around 50K of storage memory. All right? So what does that mean? It actually makes us very lean and efficient. So if we compare that to actually running like a virtual machine on something, yeah, we're much lower footprint, so we can get onto these tiny devices. It's really, really useful. Now, power is also very important on embedded systems, but also really important for kids, because they tend not to like change your batteries very much. In fact, one of the early design principles, we wanted this thing to actually run off uh, a lithium uh, coin cell for a reasonable amount of time, a tiny thing. So we actually did a full profile, actually, of what our energy profile actually looks like. And this is actually an independent survey taken by someone in the UK. And we've also augmented this with the latest version of, uh, of the runtime. And you see, when we're basically idling, we run at something around 2 milliwatts of power. So what does that mean? If you're just doing a little bit of background processing, storing a bit of data from your accelerometer, a trip, two AAA batteries, as you'll see on the battery pack, gets you about nine months of runtime on this thing. And just for comparison, you know, if you were to compare that to some of the other hardware that's typically out there today, so like a, a Raspberry Pi 3 will be 2,000 milliwatts running full out. 
uh, Pi Zero is 500 milliwatts, and an Arduino Uno is around about 400. Okay, so these are much more high power consuming devices. Now, we do have to be careful, of course, because, you know, as we all know, apples aren't oranges. A Raspberry Pi is a much more computationally powerful device, right? And Microbit certainly isn't competing in that space. But it does provide an interesting reference. So the final thing I just want to mention about is some of the radio capabilities. So let's take a quick look at this. So the other thing we did was to take each of those kind of key sensors and actuators and devices, so each of those object models, and we exposed them using the latest version of Bluetooth, Bluetooth 4.1, using a RESTful API over Bluetooth. So you'll find a, a matching set of components for each of those uh, things on there. So you'll find an accelerometer service on BLE that will give you accelerometer data. You'll find a UART service that gives you serial access. You will find the temperature service that tells you the temperature and so on. These are all exposed to a well-defined Bluetooth API, which if you go to the Bluetooth SIG, you can download. And there are also some really cool simple apps as well. Okay, so there's some really nice ones that uh, I probably don't have time to show you because we're running a, a little bit slow today. Uh, I'm always slow, sorry for that. Uh, but you'll find over here a friend of mine, uh, Martin Woolley from, uh, from Bluetooth SIG, done some awesome work actually with Bluetooth. And you find up at the top left what he's actually done is build a little D-pad controller on his app for, for Microbit, which actually inject events into that message bus over Bluetooth. So you can create your own handlers and say, you know, whenever that Bluetooth button is, oh, that button is, pressed on a Bluetooth per device over a secure environment, go and execute this code in a memory safe, you know, threaded environment, like, like blocks, which is really cool. So here he's actually built a controller for one of those little robots. Um, he's also built a really nice app. Uh, come and see me afterwards, I'll happily show you, uh, which actually shows off all those kind of sensors on the device as well. So you can actually connect to, uh, to the micro bit and move it around and it will show you like a compass. If you uh, move the, uh, microbit around, it'll actually show you a 3D model of the microbit moving in real time next to it, actually based on all the accelerometer data, yeah, using all that gesture data. And over here was actually a full data set he built from a cycle ride, uh, a 20 mile cycle ride that he happened to do, that was actually measuring his heart rate through an attached heart rate sensor, which is super cool. So you can actually go and uh, do visit, if you're interested in this stuff, uh, Martin's site, got a load of links down there. Uh, but also very excited, we just found out uh, a few days ago, we now have Node.js support as well. So they've now actually built support for our Bluetooth profile. So you can also code in that, which is neat. Now the final point is something that uh, Tom also hinted at with some of his data streaming, which was awesome, by the way. I haven't actually seen the Azure thing flying before. Love that, love that. It's this radio interface. Now, this is something we did because we found Bluetooth is fantastic and secure and scalable and lets you talk to all your mobile devices and all that good stuff. But do you know what kids really want? They want to send a really simple message to their friends. And they want to see both sides of the communications path. And they really want to understand how it works. So we built them something different. So we built them something very, very simple where you could basically broadcast to your local area strings, simple data packets, or even single byte values. And anything in that area can then listen to that and react to it, okay? So what you actually have here, yeah, I'll show you guys tomorrow. If you come by the, uh, the demo, I'm gonna hijack a little bit of Tom's Microsoft stand and I'm gonna show you this running. It is actually a fully functional remote control car, okay? Built using pure micro bit. One for controlling the vehicle, actually on the vehicle, controlling the servos and the steering rack. The other is a fully functional remote for it. <laughs> so that you could actually you know, use the micro bit as a remote control device. Right. So imagine just for a minute giving that to a kid. Imagine, in fact, imagine rewinding back and then years until you were that age and think how much you would enjoy building your own stuff like that. Yeah, how much that would actually get you into the subject. Hey, I still get excited by this, it's really cool. Um, this is the one I built. <laughs> It's really wicked cool. Yeah, so it's actually a four by four truck about this big. Yeah, four wheel drive, four wheel steering, very cool. Fully micro bit controlled, okay? We also have lots of other examples of radio. So this top right one is actually one built in combination of uh, Lego, uh, a couple of micro bits and some motor drivers. This was written by a teacher in the UK using PXT, yeah. And finally, that's if on demand, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, just a little view about what we're doing next. Right? So we've just begun to scratch the surface of this. As, as I was mentioning, what, how we see this going forward is not just a little toy device with some LEDs on it. This is an IoT device that could be simply programmed to be an IoT device, not probably just for education, but beyond. 
So we're actually starting to develop lots of cool features which be useful on that. The first thing we're building is actually an on-chip file system. So you'll be able to actually store data within that spur flash memory on the chip. So if you actually want to go and do things like the, uh, the Bloodhound project, you can do that. You can just actually stream your, your data in your program to non-volatile memory, go away afterwards, either stream it over radio or Bluetooth, or plug it into USB and just drag and drop that file off your device. So kids can get into data science. Um, we're also uh, uh, looking for, to develop this idea of end-to-end -end IoT interfaces, but Tom's talked about that already, so I won't talk much more about that. Uh, but finally, very importantly, we're also looking for platform independence of our runtime. So beyond this, we're not going to be just looking at microbit. So pretty soon we'll be looking at other embedded devices that you could actually use, you know, both for education and other projects beyond as well. So use this as a springboard. So it's been a great learning experience for us. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Um, but if you do want to know more, there's some, uh, uh, some links up there. Please do go and uh, check us out. Come visit us on GitHub. We'd be more than happy to see you and contribute. Yeah. Thank you very much. Great stuff. Thanks, Ben. Good one. Thanks. All right, hey everybody, I'm Ben Shapiro. I'm an assistant professor of computer science at the University of Colorado Boulder. And I'm gonna speak very quickly since we're short on time. Um, I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about what the future of K-12 computer science education should be like, in my view, and how Microbit actually helps us to advance the cutting edge of that. Um, this seems to be the trend here today. Oh, weird, all right. Well, the trend here today seems to be to do a lot of like looking back at 20 something years ago and then looking at today. So uh, we're gonna go on a little back to the future adventure. Uh, we're gonna look at the past and present of computer science and computer science education and then try to project forward to now about what we should be doing in computer science education. So I'm gonna turn our time circuits on and we're gonna go back to 1985. Um, what was 1985 like? Uh, well, let me set the stage. Microsoft was a much smaller company. It was 10 years old. It certainly had a lot less revenue. Um, people were just starting to buy computers for their homes and offices in serious volumes. Uh, they were using DOS 3.2, which came out in December of that year, and Americans just started buying Nintendos. Uh, very lucky Soviets got to play Tetris, and the internet was about to take off, so Symbolics.com registered the first domain name in 1985. And also in that year, the Intel released the 386, uh, which supported things, I don't know what's up with this projector. I'll just hand wave a lot. Um, which supported things like preemption, and uh, also C++ was officially released. Um, this was also the same year that, that's frustrating, Hoare's um, Communicating Sequential Processes book came out, um, which was a key milestone in concurrent and distributed computing. Um, this is a pretty new area back then. Um, in 1985, we were actually in the heart of the first boom in K-12 computer science. Um, this is Seymour Papert. Some of you have probably heard of him. His book, Mindstorms, came out in 1982. Um, it was the first real argument for why kids should learn to program. He made a somewhat different argument than the argument people make today. Uh, his argument was that kids should learn programming so that they can learn all kinds of things other than computers. Um, this was very different than today where we talk about jobs a lot when warranting computer science ed. Um, he illustrated his argument uh, for kids programming with examples from mathematics, in particular mathematical topics like recursion and Cartesian geometry. Um, his examples frequently involve the logo programming language. This is a language he created together with several other people. Um, Man, that's frustrating. Uh, Logo is arguably the first programming language created for kids. Um, well, let's see what happens. It's a Lisp dialect, and one of the things it's known for is, I have HDMI, that's, yeah, uh, is turtle graphics. So um, this will look familiar to those of you who are at least kids in the 80s. Yeah, okay. Um, imagine the thing I just showed you. In Logo, the turtle is a mathematical object. It can be driven around the screen by calling procedures like forward and turn right to make things like this. Um, so this is what logo code looked like. Uh, we could make a procedure to abstract the behavior like, like making a square. Uh, and we could even parameterize these procedures so we could make arbitrarily big squares. Um, and so when we look back to then, 
the programming that we wanted kids to be able to know about in 1985 was involved things like loops and conditionals, maybe drawing graphics on a screen, reading input from a keyboard, and maybe for the really precocious ones, making procedures that could take parameters. Um, as I'll show you in a second, computer science has moved on. Like this is not cutting edge computer, computer science at this point. It wasn't even in 1985. Um, but computer science education has in many ways been frozen in time, okay? So what we're gonna do now is get back in our DeLorean and turn our time circuits back on and hop back to now. Okay, so 2016 computer science looks really different than 1985. We have many different form factors that we use every day, including mobile phones, wearables, video game consoles, IoT devices, as well as PCs. Um, they all run different operating systems, yet manage mostly to interoperate with each other. Um, every system up here is networked, uh, and fewer and fewer of the programs that we run on them work well without network connections. Um, in fact, many of the applications that we use these systems for depend on and are part of complicated distributed systems. Uh, for example, it doesn't make sense to run a Bing search just on your own laptop. You need the backing of a whole cloud to do it. Um, computing is also very social now. It's a way to connect to other people, not just to crunch data. Um, a final point about what's different now is that many of our systems have transcended the algorithmic realm, right? Statistical models are now as crucial to our daily uses of computing as algorithms are, okay? So to summarize, computing today is uh, highly internetworked. It's dependent upon concurrent distributed systems. Uh, it's architecturally heterogeneous, and it's also social and statistical. Um, so what I wanna do now is, is switch topics slightly to look at what computer science education is like in 2016. In 85, we were in the first CS education boom. Today, we're in the second boom. Um, so I wanna sort of summarize what's going on today, and it's gonna be a good news, bad news, and WTF news kind of description of what CS education looks like right now. Yeah, do you wanna, is there a different HDMI cable? So I will, uh, I will keep talking. Can you all imagine things being up there? Okay, so what's happening right now? Right now, there's lots of activity happening at the federal level in the United States. Uh, President Obama recently announced his CS for All initiative. He called for every student, uh, he called for getting every student hands-on computer science and math classes that would make students job ready on day one. Um, this is exciting. It's also a very different rationale than the idea of computing as a way to learn about the world around you. Fortunately, they're not mutually exclusive. It's possible to learn about things and also get a great job. So that's nice. Um, his initiative comes at a time when more kids than ever are trying computer science. And there's a lot of folks who've helped made that happen. Uh, Code.org deserves, I think, a ton of credit for promoting the cause of giving programming a try. Uh, but there's been a whole lot of other actors in this space as well. Um, one of the things you can't see right now is an amazing graph of uh, the number of new logins per month that Code.org is getting. Uh, I put a power law trend on it, and you sort of see how quickly that's happening. Um, you can also see on the other slide that you can't see the number of US schools that are starting to offer AP computer science. So um, just to read off my slide, in 2010, there were about 19,000 schools. In 2015, there were about 46,000 schools. So that's a pretty fast growth rate. Um, and there's also a national effort underway to develop K-12 computer science standards. And that involves a whole bunch of stakeholders, including school districts, teachers associations, the ACM, and researchers like me. Um, while we're having this crazy, amazing growth, there are still huge inequalities in computer science education, okay? We, the field right now, the number of people learning CS and doing CS doesn't look anything like the gender, race, and economic mix of our country, okay? It's still largely white and Asian males. Um, so I'm gonna skip through some graphs sort of showing you what this looks like at the K-12 level. My students and I, have actually called every school in the Boulder, Denver, and areas in between to figure out what kinds of computing courses they offer. We've looked up census data and other data to map out um, who actually gets access to computing. It turns out if you're rich and white, your schools have CS. Otherwise, they tend not to, okay? Um, to do another sort of 1985 jump, we 
also have a slide that you can't see, sort of talking about what does gendered participation in CS look like at the university level? And what you see is that actually 1985 was the peak of women taking university level CS courses, and it's gone down monotonically ever since then. Okay, so there's this huge growth, but there's also been actually increasing inequality in who is learning CS. And one of the things that we're really excited about with Microbit is that we can actually challenge both of these things. We can challenge the extent to which uh, computing education is stuck in time, that it doesn't reflect contemporary computing in terms of what's the substance of CS. How do we get beyond sort of basic introductory ideas like loops and if statements and actually get into distributed computing, network computing, machine learning, things like this. And also, how do we create experiences for doing that that are inclusive and that draw in girls, students of color, and everybody else who should be learning computing? Yeah, I'll talk and we can fiddle the cable. So um, what I want to do is make the argument to you that 2016 computer science education should look like 2016 CS, okay? That means that we need to think about how many of the facets that are part of contemporary computing, like networking and other things, are part of what kids learn, okay? So that means um, kids should be able to make network stuff, and we saw some examples of that. Kids should be able to tap into and maybe even build their own distributed systems. They should be able to build new applications um, out of different kinds of computing systems, such as wearables that can interact with IoT devices around themselves. And they should be able to build technologies that can connect them to their friends. Dana Boyd here at MSR has shown so very well how kids can make very sophisticated choices about how to use social computing tools. And what we think is that that's great, but we should also empower them to build their own social computing tools, to take their insights about how they want to connect to other people and use them to build new technologies. Okay? So uh, let me fix my shit here. All right. Can you see that? Hey, hey, thank you. Okay, so I want to turn now to the micro bit even more quickly than I planned to before. Um, I think it's the first mass-produced CS education tool that actually reflects 2016 computing. So computing today is all of these things. And what I want to do now is show you really quickly how the micro bit actually lets us tap into a bunch of facets of this, okay? So the first I want to talk about is wearables. Um, there's been a bunch of research of late showing that creating wearable electronics, especially where electronic textiles, I think it's yeah. Um, can enable underrepresented populations of kids to really engage in computing, okay? So girls from different ethnicities and Native American boys can get really excited about building wearable electronics like these. <laughs> All right, and they can see what I got. There we go. Okay. So um, this is, these are pictures from Kristen Searle and Yasmin Kafai's work showing a huge range of interesting ways in which kids have created wearable sort of clothing, purses, bags, other kinds of accessories that have computing embedded in them, okay? And this work has been extremely successful with girls as well as Native American boys in creating ways to combine traditional craft and fashion with computing and electronics. E-textiles can be quite functional. So this is Leah Beakley um, wearing a light up bike jacket that she made. Uh, it has buttons on the sleeves that let her control turn signals uh, so she doesn't get by a car. Um, when she was a grad student at Boulder's Craft Technology Lab, she invented the Lilypad Arduino, which is the microcontroller board you see in the top right there. Um, the board is actually specifically engineered to be sewable. So you'll see that the board itself has a round shape, um, which makes it a little bit more comfortable to wear than something that has corners. And you can also see the little eyelets that have thread laced through them. Okay, so she engineered the board to be sewable. And this, uh, the thread that's used there is special thread that has tiny uh, conductive fibers embedded in it that conduct electricity. I have some up here if anybody wants to see. So the, the lily pad is a really nice example of how we can create new technologies that can engage kids through craft. Unfortunately, programming on the Arduino is not a very fun experience. Um, you have to write low-level systems code in C++. Um, so let me give you an example. This is what the minimum Arduino code is to make it so you press a button to turn on a light and you press it again to turn it off. 
Okay? So to build this program, you have to do things like manage state over time and build an event dispatcher and all these kinds of things that are a little bit insane to inflict on new programmers. Um, so in a lot of ways, we've taken the rich possibilities of wearables and then made a software experience that takes kids back in time. Um, in fact, to 1985 when C++ was invented, since that's what the Arduino uses. Um, so that, that's not good, and there's a lot that we can do to make it better. Um, fortunately, as you've seen, the microbit makes the programming side of physical computing a lot easier. So instead of writing that gob of C++, we can write a fairly straightforward program that looks something like this. Um, and we can see that uh, the usability difference is quite stark, and that's actually been our experience with kids, is that they get up and running much more quickly um, when we have some kids using one and some kids using another. One hitch we've run into is that the board is designed to do a lot of things well, but it's not designed to be sewn with. So the distance here is a little too great. So these are nice for looping thread through, but what happens is your thread wobbles and you short the adjacent pins, and we've killed a few boards that way. So um, what we need to do is modify the board. Fortunately, that's easy. Um, we introduced a couple micro bits to our friend Mr. Bansaw and to Ms. Dremel, and I, I feel bad because I promised to return the boards to Tom, but oh, so well. We're even after this projector thing. So after a few seconds of really terrible sound, um, this is our first time using a bandsaw, by the way, um, we were able to modify it. So you can see the board sort of ends right at the little eyelets there. We've got a couple of them up here if, if you want to see. Um, and so we were able to stitch it and make a bracelet. Um, we added some Velcro, and, um, and we have this nice sort of cuff thing that you can try out. Um, so even though the microbit wasn't designed to be sewn with, we found it pretty straightforward to use for e-textiles. Um, and in the past few weeks, we've run camps for local girls where they've built bracelets and modified clothing with the microbit. Um, these camps, by the way, were sponsored by NC Witt and led by Carrie Santos, who's a grad student and instructor in our Research Institute's Creative Technology Design Program. Um, this is a microbit emoji bracelet that one of the participants made. Um, and one of the things that I want to show you is how we can get from the genre of wearables into new things that haven't previously been done with kids using microbit. And to do that, I want to turn to the networking support that both Joe and Tom talked about. So as you've heard, the microbit does wireless networking. And it's possible to use, use it in various ways. One is this sort of broadcast abstraction. So to do that, you sort of need two blocks. One is this set group block, which sort of joins you to a near range multicast group. And then the other is this send string or send integer block. Um, and so what can kids do with this? Well, one example um, that a lot of the girls we've talked to have been excited about is the idea of sort of creating digital versions of these best friend necklaces. Has anybody seen these? Yes? OK, so you know what I'm talking about. So these are pretty popular with young girls. They um, give half to a best friend and wear the other half. And this fall, we're excited to start running workshops where girls make digital versions of this, right? So you could imagine two programs. They're identical except for the integers that they pattern match on and, and broadcast. Um, but you could make some sort of wearable for yourself, one for a friend, uh, give it to them, and then when you're nearby each other, they can light up to signify your friendship, right? So this fall, we're actually going to be running networked friendship jewelry workshops together with our local library system. Uh, which I think will be a really fun way to start linking wearables and crafting together with networking. I'm not aware of anybody ever doing that before. Um, that networked jewelry example is, is, is actually an instance of how we can create projects with microbit that bring together networking, wearables, and social interaction. So a lot of the research that we do with young people points to their eagerness to build heterogeneous systems that connect together multiple technologies. Um, in our camps this summer, the girls got really excited about wanting to connect their microbits to other systems that they were building. So what we ran weren't just microbit workshops. They were things where kids made mobile apps. Um, they also made wearables for themselves and for their pets. They used stuffed, stuffed pets to model this, because I don't know about bringing animals into our lab and all the rules. Um, and they also used uh, the Blocky Talkie platform from our lab. You can see a sort of IoT device mounted on the wall behind the girls. So one of the girls built a um, wirelessly networked toothbrush that was mounted on the wall 
so that her sibling, who doesn't have control of her hands, could brush her teeth. So there's a toothbrush there mounted to a motor connected to a device that she built in program that can communicate over the network. Um, the girls liked doing these projects, but they wanted to weave them together into more sophisticated systems, right? So they wanted to be able to have a wearable that could turn on and off the toothbrush, for example. Um, and that's work that we're planning to, to sort of do over the next year or two, is to really think about how they can learn about more complicated ideas in computing by bringing together different kinds of systems. So we've seen so far how the microbit can enable us to get into networking, wearables, and social computing. I also want to touch on machine learning. And I have no idea if the sound will work, but if not, you'll hear me make computer sounds. Um, microbit has enough sensors built into it to make it usable as an input device for interactive machine learning applications. So uh, not everybody here will be familiar with interactive machine learning. So just really quickly, it's an approach to machine learning in which humans guide the creation and improvement of models through manipulation of the learning process, especially by changing training examples over time. Right? So in more conventional machine learning, there's a sense in which the training data is a fixed ground truth, and then you try to build models around it that can sort of uh, best capture what's going on in the data set. Um, in interactive machine learning, systems builders can experiment with changes to the data, such as changing gestures and things like this, in order to figure out how to build more reliable models. Okay? Um, my collaborator, Rebecca Fiebrink, is a leading researcher in interactive machine learning for HCI. And one of the things that she's played around with is prototyping tools to connect the micro bit to interactive machine learning systems. Okay, so I'm going to show you an example of her quickly training a model around microbit sensors and then using it to control a synthesizer. So you'll see her randomly generate some sounds within this sort of space of possible sounds to come out of the synth. And then you'll see her train the model to associate different physical positions, orientations of the microbit to different points in that sound space. Okay? You kind of explore um, the sound space, find a sound that I like map that to a particular tilt, and then I can use this to continually interpolate between those different sounds. So let's give this a try. Okay, so one of the things we're really excited about is investigating how combining interactive machine learning tools like Rebecca's Weckinator, along with data visualization tools and computer art and music tools, can enable young people to learn about statistics, data modeling, and machine learning. Okay, I don't have any results there to tell you other than we've been piloting some of this stuff and it's really fun to make weird noises. Um, the other thing I, I want to kind of close on is that this doesn't just have to be about sound and music, and it doesn't just have to involve kids. There's a ton of potential for learning in higher education as well. Okay? So one thing that we really want to explore is how student athletes, for example, could use interactive machine learning to build and train their own custom fitness wearables that help them while they're practicing particular skills. Okay? And this can get way beyond the kinds of step counters that Fitbit and Microsoft and everybody else is selling. Right? So they could make their own devices that make sure they're built doing squats correctly so that they don't hurt themselves. Let me show you an example from an undergrad of mine. Right? So Leah was a psych major and a personal trainer, and she'd never built any sort of computing stuff before and spent a year to make this in Arduino. One of the things we're really excited about is how the micro bit could vastly accelerate that process and open it up so that students like Leah, hopefully she's, you know, she's applying to med school, so hopefully future med students, um, could actually use machine learning to build custom wearables to help their patients. So there's a ton of potential there that I think has been hugely underexplored. So to summarize, I think that the future of CS education needs to look a lot more like the future of computer science in general. Um, we shouldn't have kids stuck in front of PCs building isolated programs using only ideas and techniques from 30 years ago. Instead, we need to embrace ex emerging trends in computer science and in industry and academia and use new technologies like the microbit 
to figure out how to empower kids to learn 21st century computer science. Thank you. All right. And thank you for your patience with the crazy projections. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, Joe, why don't you come up? Uh, we got started a little late, and uh, we had some technical difficulties, and I didn't keep to my allotted time. But let's take a few minutes for questions, because I, I know I promised that we would have questions at the end. Um, so are there any questions from the audience for any of our speakers, including myself? Uh, so I think the uh, ones that are in the UK, Basically, ten pounds. Ten so pounds. That, so that's like fifty cents for the current exchange rate, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Guys. Yeah. So 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 yeah. So and I think the price will probably come down over time as, so. as they yeah. produce more. Yeah, they're they're pretty cheap. Mm -hmm. uh, in the back, Catherine. That's right. So the question is really about training. Uh, if you're going to make this even work in, you know, if you're going to make this work in K-12, where are you going to get the teachers and what level of sophistication do you need? Ben, maybe that's that's one best for you. Yeah, so it's, it's a really hard problem. There's clearly not enough resources out there right now for teacher training. Um, that said, I think people would sometimes be surprised by what sort of well-motivated teachers with fairly minimal training can accomplish. So. We've been doing a bunch of work in schools with teachers who've gotten on the order of you know, a couple days worth of training where we've had kids build all kinds of interactive computer music systems and things like this. And so I think the question of training often boils down to what, what are our most important things for kids to learn? Is it that they get a brief taste of computing, in which case not that much training is needed, or is it that they actually learn some computer science in a deep way? Personally, I sort of lean more towards the latter. And in that case, significant and substantial computer science education training is necessary. Mm. Yeah. I mean, just, just kind of tip in on that. Um, one thing we actually found in the UK, which is kind of cool, is that, uh, oh, I think you're on, there we go. Yeah, yeah is that actually, be, because this kind of micro bit was so friendly and kind of accessible, it actually didn't scare the teachers either. It wasn't just about the kids. Actually, the teachers thought, oh, hey, I can deal with this. I can deal with these blocks. And actually got them started, from which point they could start their journey too. So I actually found that you know, approachability and accessibility is really important. Catherine, you might also talk to Kevin, who's behind you, uh, who works with, he's the leader of Teals, which gets uh, technologists into the classrooms to help teach APCS in the high schools and get training going both ways. Um, so we, we, Microsoft is actively trying to address uh, that problem. Other, other questions? Kevin, did you have one? Okay. Well, thank you very much for coming again. If you'd like a micro bit, please see me. I just need your email, and I'm happy to give you a micro bit with a, uh, a battery holder. You'll have to supply your own micro USB cable, but I think most people have those these days. Again, uh, we're really interested, as you see, the micro bit is an interesting design uh, point in the design space, uh, but we're moving on, doing uh, thinking a lot more about uh, uh, the education aspects, uh, the runtime, the platform, hardware, software, uh, making it very simple to take these microcontroller uh, based devices and make them more easily programmable uh, by everyone. And, uh, and so I, I think there's a lot of room for, for ideas, a lot of room for invention, and uh, we, welcome, we welcome your input. And uh, we'd love to work with you too. So thanks again.